morning, good afternoon, whatever time of day it is that you are listening, folks. Thank you very, very much for listening. Day today is the 5th of April, year of our Lord, 2024. Welcome to yet another edition of the Coping Hour, hosted by Nicholas Inkle, a.k.a. Motown Noah. Got a bad show for you guys today. I want to uh, lead with a, a quick little housekeeping note. Somebody had left a comment on a previous Spotify episode. I want to address it really quickly. Timestamps are weird on there, the little chapters that you get on the timeline. On YouTube, it's always a non-issue. It's never a problem. On Spotify, sometimes it's weird and the timeline like doesn't actually sh- it doesn't display the chapters. Always use the description. The description is your best friend because even if the timestamps don't directly translate to the timeline, they will always still be in the description so you guys still can uh, figure out what you do care about, what you don't care about in the episode, and, and skip around accordingly. So timestamps are your friend, and even on Spotify, they will always be available in the description. Now, originally, what I wanted to do today uh, for the open is I wanted to do like a 5-10 to 10 minute segment on the worst 50-point performances in the history of the NBA. This, of course, was coming off of the heels of Malachi Flynn dropping 50 off of the bench, for Detroit, which is a conversation that we will have in just a moment. But then I was, I, I started to look into it. I spent like 20 minutes doing some research on it. It really just wasn't that interesting because, like, what do you want me to do? You want me to bring up the Corey Brewer thing? First of all, everybody's bringing up the Corey Brewer thing. We all know Corey Brewer up to that point was like one of the more random 50 point games that we had lived through. Uh, I think of like Mo Williams. Mo Williams had one because it was one shot, I think it was later in the game, where he was like falling to the side. He's basically falling over, and he put up a three, and it went down. Uh, what the hell? Wasn't Mo Williams doing uh, – this could be a false memory, but I think he was wearing, like, one of the T-shirt jerseys with double sleeves. I loved that look so much, and especially Mo Williams because I think he also did the headband too. Love Mo Williams. That one's up there too. But Mo Williams had been, like, a bucket in the past, even if it wasn't, like, 50 points in a game type of bucket. Like, technically, it didn't surprise that many people, even if it was kind of old. I would throw in there, like, a 30, what was he, 35 or something. However old Jamal Crawford was when late in his career, he had, like, the most random 50-point game um, for a guy that age. That was actually, uh, as a little history lesson, that Jamal Crawford 50-piece was the same night that Anthony Davis walked into the arena for the Pelicans wearing a shirt that said, that's all, folks. And I don't remember if it was that summer that he was traded or if it was the subsequent summer, but that was kind of when it was the boiling. It really did start to boil over for Anthony Davis and the relationship that he had with the Pelicans and that he wanted to get out of there. Now, Malachi Flynn dropping 50 points for the Pistons. Boy, oh boy. Let's start with the being for real response to this. That's awesome for him. I mean, you talk about a guy who the lowest career point per game average in the history of the NBA for someone to drop 50 points. That's objectively cool. And it also goes to show that, dog, this is the NBA. Anybody can bust your shit open on any given night. That's just how it doesn't matter who you are. If you're in the league, you're one of the best 300-some-odd players in the entire world at that sport. It's games like this that go to show that. Now, here's what pissed me off. I wasn't watching. You think I was watching that game? You're out of your mind. I live by a very strict rule. First of all, I already don't watch the Pistons much these days. It's clear that they punted on the season. So I think in turn, it's only fair that I and many other fans have also punted on the season. But, you know, there are a few games that I'll still get up for here and there as long as Cade is playing. That's the rule. No Cade, no Nick. And guess what? There was no Cade in this game. So you go into it thinking like, that's cool for Jaden Ivey. Maybe he'll get to, you know, put up a, you know, a performance where he kind of proves something. And then he went like three for 18. You're like, okay. And then Malachi Flynn drops 50 off the bench. And this is the thing. Here's the take. So Jason Tatum, not Jason Tatum, um, Luka Doncic and Joel Embiid go for 70 and Cat goes for 60 all within the span of like nine days. And the NBA is scrambling to correct. They're like, how the fuck do we reconcile with what we've done to the NBA? And the consequences of that have been scoring has been down, not like drastically, but it's marginal enough that we've noticed it. And since then, I think there's only been two 50 point games which was Jalen Brunson's 61, which happened like a week and a half ago, and then now Malachi Flynn dropping 50 for the Pistons. If they, as the refs, decided to sort of change course after Joel Embiid and Luka go for 70 and Cat goes for 60, what the fuck do you do when Malachi Flynn gives you 50? 
been watching the rewatching the Hunger Games series recently. Do you invite peacekeepers onto the court and you shoot anybody on site whose career points per game average is less than 10 and all of a sudden you look up at the scoreboard and they're at 35? Kill their motherfucking ass. What are you talking about? This is disgusting. Huh? Now, what's cool about it is it was on 25 shots. That's pretty cool. It's also cool because it was off the bench. But here's what I don't like. Here's what I don't like. Is you have this game of... Th I don't know if you can hear that siren, and I apologize if it's making this hard to listen to. You have this B-story Game of Thrones-ass villain in Malachi Flynn dropping 50. And the, th the three previous 50-point games in, in Pistons history were... It was Rip in either the late 2000s or the early 2010s. And then it was a while until we had one. And then it was Blake in 2018... Yeah, 2018 Blake against the Sixers had 50, and then after that, it was Sadiq Bey. Those are three players who you're like, wow, 50 out of those guys? That only makes sense. I could sit here and do an hour on Blake's 50-point game. I could sit here and do two hours on that season that he played. All of that, oh, Rip Hamilton, bucket, all of that only makes sense. Rip Hamilton, like sneaky, was he DeMar DeRozan before DeMar DeRozan, but just on less volume? People are talking about it. The mid-range merchant. Now we have to throw Malachi Flynn into the zeitgeist. That sucks. <laughs> for a guy who's just not going to be here, you know, for him to be able to etch his name in, in the Pistons history books like that is devastating. Shit! Fuck! Malachi Flynn. Good for him, though, at the end of the day. Now, games I watched this week. This is my favorite segment. You know, I went into last night, and I'm looking at the slate, and I see Kings versus Knicks, and I think to myself, I don't know if there's a game that deserves my attention more than this, because this was coming right off of the heels of the news breaking that Julius Randle is, eh, record scratch, freeze frame. You're probably wondering how Julius Randle got here, out for the season, undergoing season-ending surgery on his shoulder that he fucked up in January. Uh, Chris Haynes reported during the game, I don't know if this was known, I guess Julius Randle had attempted to come back like two weeks after that injury happened and he was like in a full contact practice and then he re-injured it again and it basically put him back to the ground floor and he's like uh, what am I supposed to do so he tried and it just didn't work and he had to and then you also have like OG Ananobi who gets to the Knicks and he plays really well you know when, when Brunson, Randall, and Ananobi are all in the starting lineup the Knicks were 11 and 1 so OG's great and then he gets hurt and then he tries to come back he plays like three games then he gets hurt again I don't know is there a timetable on when he comes back I genuinely don't know so like that sucks and then on the Kings side of things you have Kevin Herter and Malik Monk just done for the year Malik Monk not technically done for the year but that we can call it what it is unless they go to the Western Conference Finals Malik Monk is not coming back Kevin Herter is actually just shut down for the entire season so I'm looking at this game and I'm thinking to myself this is the ultimate game of who wants it more in a moment where there's a lot to prove where you know do because here's the this is what you have to give credit to the Knicks for is when dudes are out so many guys on that roster embrace the challenge of having to play big minutes and I think it's easy to feel that way a when Tibbs is your coach and b when you're in this late stretch of the season where you look around the NBA and maybe I should wait to do this point there's a lot to play for for a lot of teams I'll just leave it at that for now but you go into this Knicks Kings game and I was originally thinking I was going to turn it off after like the first quarter because I really wanted to flip over to the Rockets and the Warriors game but I stuck with it you know the the Kings eventually go up 21 early in this game it's giving some real honk shoo me 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 energy and then the Knicks decided actually <laughs> we forgot the game started and we do want to play basketball there is something to be said about Isaiah Hartenstein who who probably had I don't know what his career high in assists is but I think this may have been the best passing game that he's ever played he had nine assists he arguably should have had like 12 there were a few smoked assist opportunities even one in the in the final minute of the game when both teams are just kind of bullshitting around waiting for the game to be done I don't remember who he passed to but they smoked the the attempt and it was like ah Isaiah Hardenstein almost had 10 assists in this game and it wasn't just like trailer passes easy kickouts like he was throwing some sneaky voodoo shit around there was one sequence where Brunson feeds him in the in the high post and then Hartenstein like does some ha, 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 
down to Josh Hart around the basket. Josh Hart might have been the story of this game. Josh Hart just flies around on a basketball court. Had a, a I don't think it was a career high, but he did have a season high in points in this one. And, and he was everywhere on both sides of the floor. You look at a guy like Jalen Brunson, had two points in the first quarter, and the Kings are throwing everything, everything, everything. They're throwing the kitchen sink at this guy. They're doubling him. They're trapping him. And if it wasn't Jalen Brunson splitting that shit, he was just passing it out to like an open Dante DiVincenzo or like an open Miles McBride or an open Bogdanovich. You know what I mean? It's so hard for me to quantify the love that I have developed for Jalen Brunson this season. Now, here's what's fun is the day that we're recording this. Uh, well, I guess it's the day that it's releasing too. Jacob, a.k.a. Rusty Buckets, and his uh, producer extraordinaire, Rudy, will be at my house in like three hours. We are going to the Bulls-Knicks game tonight. Originally, when this was scheduled like a week and a half ago, I was like, that's cool. Like, yeah, we can go to the Bulls-Knicks, I guess. And then since then, I've just – I've fallen in love – with Jalen Brunson in a, in a way, and I already liked him, but since then I've just gotten more and more excited. I'm just nervous because it's the second night of a back-to-back, so I'm just telegraphing this now. If Jalen Brunson doesn't play in this game, uh, I'm going to... Why did I... Why, I don't know why I said that. I'm going to be really upset if Jalen Brunson does not play in this game just because it's the second night of a back-to-back, and I don't know, hey, he's durable and he likes to play in these games, but please... Please let me see Jalen Brunson in person. Please let this happen. Jalen Brunson was great. Finishes the game with 35. You you look at it. Dante DiVincenzo. Dante DiVincenzo. Is there anybody in the NBA right now, right now, who has a greener light than Dante DiVincenzo? Absolutely torched the heat the other night. Absolutely torched the Pistons. Like, what was that? Maybe two weeks ago. Didn't he set? Isn't? I say he torched the Pistons. I don't think he even just did that. Didn't he set the Knicks franchise record for most threes made in a single game? Maybe I should look that one up on the fly. Here's my, can I give you some beef that I have with the Knicks? It's not the Knicks problem. It's not their fault that this is the case. When are we going to call out that we're getting tricked by Alec Burks? Because I can look at the Knicks roster. Josh Hart. Not a shooter, but a score. Dante DiVincenzo, shooter. Miles McBride, shooter. Jalen Brunson, shooter. Bogdanovich, shooter. And then you get to Alec Burks, and you want to, your brain tells you it's Alec Burks. It's Alec Burks. That's eight to 10 points off the bench every game. It's not, it's just not anymore. I don't know what's going on with him. And I maybe there's a game or two that I've missed since he's gotten to New York where he's, you know, caught fire and he's, you know, put up like 15. Maybe it's happened and I just haven't seen it. But I feel like we're, we've been on this trend for like three or the three-ish years with Alec Burks where you just kind of get tricked into thinking that he's a bucket. And then like once every four weeks, he'll give you one game. But then everything else is on the margins. He hardly even got to play for the Knicks in this game. Only, only logged two minutes. So, like, whatever. But it's games like this that if you're New York, and it, at the beginning it is it was if you're Sacramento, and we'll talk about them in just a second, but it's games like this for the Knicks that it's like maybe it's, they're survivable because the Kings aren't a bad team. They're a bad team comparatively in the West. Not a bad team. They're just an okay team. And in, in, in the grand, in the, the pantheon of all the playoff teams this year, you know, the Kings are like very comfortably a C tier team where you don't really give them a shot to win a series. You know, it's going to be pretty heavily contingent on their matchup, but the odds are certainly not in their favor. So you look at a team like the Knicks and they're able to come back from down 21 early in this game and really claw their way back into it. I got to tell you, it just gave me hope because we, I've loved to sit here on this show and talk about, like, dog, if they don't get it from Randall in the playoffs, there's there's just not a chance. There's just no way. Well, now that we can comfortably say they don't have Julius Randall, we've officially played one game since we know for a fact that Julius Randall will not be available in the playoffs for the rest of the season. And the Knicks look not only survivable, but, like, pretty fucking good. Pretty fucking good for, like, 70% of this game. And it was the 70% that actually mattered the most. As long as you're getting it from, you know, Dante DiVincenzo and you're getting it from Josh Hart, like, I feel pretty good. As long as Miles McBride is able to knock down, like, I don't know, three threes? We're not asking for that much. Like, they're going to be okay. They're going to be able to beat, you know, Cleveland. 
you know, I don't know. I, I maybe I should look at the seedings right now, but there are a handful of teams where you're like, yeah, they can they can do this. It sucks if because if you put them against, I think right now they they would be playing Orlando is what it is. Yeah, I feel good about that. That's just defense though. That's that's really all that series is going to be is defense. I think it's going to be a lot of it's going to be very reminiscent of like the mid two thousands playoff final scores that were like not quite the 87 to 71 final scores but it'll be it'll be modernized in a way that it's like 99 to 87 or some bullshit like that you know what i mean Mm. but i like the knicks i love them i can't get enough of them i told myself this week i said nick you can't watch dallas (laughs) you're not allowed to watch dallas because if you do on friday's episode all you're gonna do is talk about the mavericks and it was really difficult for me last night when I was flipping on this game, because I'm not, I don't, I can't do two screens. I just can't. I need to lock into one game. That's just how I enjoy doing it. But I, mm, mm, man, I really, really wanted to watch that Dallas Atlanta game because I'm like, you're putting Luca up against the Hawks. That's like his bread and butter. That's, he has Atlanta right where he wants them as soon as he walks in the door. That's like, that's his shit. So I didn't watch that game. Luca went off. Kyrie went off. Seems like everything went well on that front. People are also sneaky starting to pivot. They're starting to pivot, folks. I don't know if you've seen this, and I don't know if you've heard about this. People want Luka to be the MVP. Now, here's the thing. We could sit here and we could talk about... We could sit here and we could talk about, you know, uh, uh, this this Nuggets-Clippers game that happened last night. Another one that was sneaky on some honk, shoo, me, 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 energy for, like, the first quarter. The Nuggets went up by like 17. It was 20 something to eight. And you're like, what the, f- what's going on? What's going on here? Before the game, they're talking about, oh, you know, how is James Harden going to get back into a rhythm? He's James fucking Harden. I don't think he can rely on anybody else to do that. It was a point that I believe even Shaq made during the, uh, the TNT pregame show. I agreed with them. I was like, what do you want Paul George to do about that? What do you want Kawhi to do about that? Kawhi's not even playing. You know what I mean? It's James Harden. If you can't get up four shots in a quarter, I don't know. You're James fucking Harden. You're bringing the ball up the floor like almost all the time. Can I give you my worst take about the? It's not really a take uh, or an observation. It's just gonna. It's just gonna sound dumb. It's just gonna sound dumb. It's about the Clippers. Every time I watch the Clippers, and they mention like there are four future Hall of Famers on this team, I go Paul George, and Kawhi Leonard, and I'm like James Harden. Who the fuck? Zubats? Who's the fuck? And then it's always as I'm doing that mental exercise, Russell Westbrook will check in. And I'm, oh, my God. How the fuck? I forgot they have Russell. Every single game, I forget that they have Russell Westbrook, which sucks because this is maybe the most valuable to a team that Russell Westbrook has been in X amount of years, just in terms of the energy that he brings, where it's like if shit's kind of going left for the Clippers a little bit, which, by the way, was exactly what happened in last night's game. As soon as Russell Westbrook checked in, the Clippers get off to a start with their bench unit in this game. They're up 21 zip in bench points over the Nuggets. Huh? You're like, what? You're like, huh? And it's because of dudes like Russell Westbrook. It's because of the energy that he brings, the spark that he provides for that team that, I, credit to him, dude, the Clippers ended up winning this game. No thanks to literally anybody on the Nuggets. No thanks to literally any of them. Jokic checks out for eight minutes in the entirety of this game. He plays 40 minutes, and it was those eight minutes that he was out of the game that the Clippers were able to win. That's not good. That's not great. But if you want to talk about the MVP and you want to talk about when the, you know, the the Nuggets aren't necessarily in this do or die game against the Clippers, it's certainly one that would be nice to win on the road in Los Angeles in crypto. And your best player can't check out for eight minutes without shit hitting the fan. Mavs fans are going to be like, ask Luca to check out for five minutes and fucking see what happens. I get it. I get it. And I, it's, it's weird with Jokic this year. I just don't, I don't feel the fatigue. Because I've been watching him. Because I've been watching him. And I, I, I see what he does. He had this he had this bullshit behind the back dribble and then no look behind the back pass that he was trying to throw to the corner if Christian Brown was in the spot that he was supposed to be in, you know, using air quotes and Jokic was pissed. Uh that it ended up flying out of bounds because Christian Brown was trying to do a baseline cut to the basket. And it's just the little things here and there. Is there a more 
disrespectful guy to be shooting threes over your team. Every the, in the in the first half, because you know these West Coast games, we can't make it through the whole game anymore. You know, after the first half, we're like, all right, let's go to bed. Jokic knocks down two threes in this first half. My girlfriend bursts out laughing both times they were made because they look so bad going up, but they just rip the net. They don't even touch the rim. And you're just left to be like, what the fuck? What? Like, (laughs) he doesn't take that many, honestly, but every time he does, it's like, okay, (laughs) I guess that can go in. So if they want to give Luka the MVP, dog, I'm the one who's been sitting up here talking fucking ad nauseum about Dallas and about Luka. I'm not the guy who's going to be upset about that. I'm just saying, like, I just, I would be a little bit surprised because it feels like we're just doing that because people are tired of talking about Jokic being the MVP. Um, I I guess people have stopped talking about Shea. I guess that's just not a, I don't, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just, I'm just telling you what the people are saying on, on digitally, you know, what these voters themselves are talking about. It's not really Shea anymore. It seems like it's Luka, and it seems like it's Jokic. It's going to happen with Luka eventually. Do they just get the first one out of the way? And then that way, you know, a year or two from now, we can go back to our regularly scheduled programming of voting for Jokic for MVP? That remains to be seen. I want to talk for a brief moment about these Sacramento Kings. Because this first quarter, you're like, oh my god. Everything positive that I spent 10 minutes talking about with the Knicks, I was planning to say about the Kings. You have DeMontis Sabonis who went out there and recorded, it was either his 59th straight double-double or that was his 60th. I I think it was 59th, which is ridiculous, but that's just, you know, such is life. It's just what he does. Here are my two favorite things about watching DeMontis Sabonis play. One, his hook shots, because they're stupid as fuck, because he, there's like no fingertips there's no wrist he just like palms it and kind of throws it over his head like it's a damn potato masher like he's in berlin in 1944 he just like chucks it right over usually it goes in the other thing that i love watching about him is usually when it works for sacramento it's because they're running a shit ton of actions off of dribble handoffs and that's exactly what was happening in the first quarter they were just getting all the looks that they wanted because the way that Sabonis sets screens on these DHOs is like, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't understand how they're not moving screens because he always deliberately moves his hip. It's always, watch, watch Sabonis' hips when he's setting these screens on these dribble handoffs. He always pokes his hip out and he's just such like a wide bodied dude that it'll always knocks the dude off course and De'Aaron Fox can either drive to the hole or he gets a look 30 feet from the basket that he likes. It just works, man. It just works. Also, Keon Ellis. Do we love him? Do we love him? I, we might. We, we're putting a pin in it, but we might love him because he's been great ever since. Uh, I think it's. I think he's started or played pretty significant minutes in every game that the Kings have played since Kevin Herter's injury. He's been awesome. Harrison Barnes. You want to talk about getting tricked, huh? This isn't really a, the sentiment of Harrison Barnes' career is getting tricked like he's been a consistent bucket for a majority of his career but was uh MIA in this one logged uh how many minutes did he log felt like a lot of them and it doesn't tell me right here just didn't do anything Keegan Murray knocked down a couple threes in transition at his best I think either when he's moving which I don't know that the data would support that I think the data would probably support him being a better shooter when he's set and has a lot of space but I feel like it's when he's kind of on the move a little bit. Better shooter from Iowa, Keegan Murray or Caitlin Clark? Um, matter of fact, as of this recording, I think that's ridiculous. It's Caitlin Clark. As of this recording, I believe the women's final four, UConn, Iowa, Caitlin Clark versus Paige Beckers is tonight. Make sure to check that out. Here's my problem right now with the women's tournament. I don't know where to illegally stream it. Because... The normal sites that you and I both know but are not going to say out loud and type in a comment, we're not going to do that, you feds, they don't show the women's games. So I don't – I wanted to watch the Iowa LSU game more than anything in the world, but I'm a Zoomer. I don't pay for cable. (laughs) I illegally stream everything. 
but they just don't. And it's there's not even um, like with the men's tournament, you can just watch the games on like MarchMadness.com with like the CBS affiliated because it's all syndicated and they just let you watch the games for free. Well, because the women's tournament is on ESPN and ESPN's fucking racket, you're just not allowed to watch it. So that sucks. Um, who do I want, Paige or Caitlin? Paige's career has sucked because she was like the consensus number one for like th two years, two or three years. Like she was good. Usually I say when a player is really good, I say they were that bitch. I want to refrain from doing that when we're talking about <laughs> women's college basketball. But she's great. And then it, it was, I think, the beginning of last year that she blew out her knee and it was like, oh, no, she was supposed to go league. Now she can't. She comes back. She leads UConn to a great season, and it's this collision course with Caitlin Clark, this, a similar one that LSU was just on, right? Caitlin Clark got the best of them. I think she had 41. It's it's so fascinating to me, and I fucking love that there is this like revolution happening in the women's game, and I think it's you really would imagine that it's only going to improve, right? Because... What we're learning, you know, if the, the WNBA, it, you know, Caitlin Clark's going to get drafted number one overall and, and her salary is going to be what, like roughly $80,000. And that's just, you know, for playing basketball, endorsements off the court and stuff. She'll be okay. She'll be fine. $80,000. Like she's living in Indiana. She's, <laughs> she's going to be fine. But with how the NIL is and how these women are staying in college longer because they're making more money. And even then, it's like, well, they might not. Most of them aren't going to go to the league anyways, so of course they're going to stay. But even the ones who are, it's like they're going to make more money in college. So it it creates more continuity, With which, by the way, it's the same thing in the men's league. Uh, but the one and dones are always going to still be a thing there. And just doesn't really, it just doesn't really exist in women's that often. So what this creates is more continuity. I think it's better for the players. I think it's better for the schools. And I think it's better for rivalries. Shit like Iowa versus LSU. It creates this um, this this spectacle. And that's what we had on Monday when Iowa and LSU played. It was the culmination of players who had stuck around for a few years. And there was some like existing bullshit between them that you wanted to see that rematch. I think that's fantastic. I absolutely love it. Cannot wait for Caitlin Clark to get to the league. What's going on with Elena Deladon? Is she still on like a hiatus? Is she is she still like I don't want to hoop anymore, which sucks because I'm sure I've delivered this take into a microphone before. I'm sure I've done it on this show. I think if you put Elena Deladon in the NBA, she could average like eight and ten. I think she's incredible. Let's look around at some uh, of the standings. In the NBA, was there anything else on the Kings that I wanted to add? I just don't think. I just think it's over. If if this game, Kings versus Knicks, was a battle of whoever loses, it's over for them. Well, the Kings lost, and you know the score is eleven point game at the end. Just didn't really feel like it was totally indicative of the way that the Knicks were able to take over late in that game. But those damn Villanova Wildcats, man between Dante DiVincenzo, Jalen Brunson, and Joshua. I just, I can't get enough of them. I love watching them play. So if we look at the standings right now, I believe the Bulls and the Hawks each have locked in their play-in uh, play spots. So like a team like the Nets, uh, they're officially out. I don't think many of us were really ready. So right now the play-in would be, it would be Miami versus Philly, and then the Bulls versus the Hawks. And I think, ooh, Miami versus Philly is a good one. That's a good one. And then outside of that, you have the Knicks versus the Pacers. I'm sorry, the Knicks versus the Magic. Cavs Pacers is an interesting one. I don't hate that. Is Isaac Okoro if if there was a player who needed like not a revolutionary or like a renaissance season, but a season that proved to us like okay, all right, you're staying. You're staying in a bad way more than anybody. Was it Isaac Okoro? Was it him? Was that who we needed to see it out of the most? Especially if you're a Cavs fan and you've really gotten it out of him this year. So that's been fun. Not a victory lap podcast. I think one of the pre-draft notes I had written in a blog about Isaac Okoro was that he defended, like, uh, what's that guy's name from Attack of the Clones? Obi-Wan has the dart, and he goes to the diner, and he's like, what is this? 
He's got four arm- Dex. I think that guy's name was Dex. I said that Isaac Okoro plays defense like that guy because he's got super long arms, and you would think there's four of them. That dude is in passing lanes everywhere. Turns out uh, that was one of my finer... You want to talk about motherfuckers comparing players to... This guy is showing shades of Kirk Heinrich. This guy is showing shades of Dex from Attack of the Clones with the way that he plays defense. Turns out I was right about that. You look at the West. Boy, oh boy. Did the Warriors come out to play or what, Tari Eason, you motherfucker? So that's over, right? So that's over. With the Warriors winning last night, I mentioned earlier I I wanted to switch over to that game. I guess it's a good thing that I didn't because what did we learn from the Warriors in that game? As somebody who didn't watch it, right? So just to be fair. But what did we learn? Yeah, so that like um, playoff experience and, you know, playing in games that matter and you, you get into the dog days of the season and like when shit gets real. Oh, so that's real. So that actually matters. Because the Warriors are just built for this. Not only are they built for games like that where it's like backs aren't quite against the wall. The cards are still in their hands. But you really want to win this game and put the Warrior, or the put the Rockets to bed. Yeah. So not only that, but also the Warriors were just put on this earth to perpetually terrorize Rockets fans. I guess that's uh, I guess that's just the way she goes. I believe the Rockets are one in three as of this recording. Since Tari East, and I, I keep saying Tari East, and it was him that did the Warriors come out to play. Yay. That was him, right? One and three since he did that. Whoops. Whoops a daisies. So the Warriors are going to get in. I don't think it's locked yet, but it looks like they're going to get in. Lakers haven't been bad. They're probably going to get in. But then you got the Kings right there. You got the Kings right there. You got the Pelicans right there. You got the Suns right there. This is what I mentioned at the beginning. I can't say it's new. To this season, I'm sure if because that's just recency bias, and I don't want to be revisionist and annoying. I'd be like, it's never been like this before. It it has, it has, but you know, to to be playing basketball in early April, and twenty of the thirty two of twenty of the thirty teams in the NBA are playing for something, whether it's you know seeding, home court advantage, um, a play in spot, not getting. Uh, you know, dropped into the play-in. There's so many storylines to be following. And in early April for this many teams, I mean, dog, you look at these standings in the West and like 10 through four, well, not 10 through four, I'll go eight through four are separated by four games. Like there's still a lay, there's only one a week and a half left of the season. Dog, who knows? Like, who do? So there's a lot that could happen. Teams are going to start to surge. Teams are going to start to have like a really weird little dip. Um, as of this recording, Minnesota is still the one, not still the one seed, but they've recaptured the one seed with the Nuggets loss last night. They have it by a game. I was saying that with Carl Anthony Towns going down at this point a month ago, maybe roughly. I was like, if the because we all said it, we all said it. If you if you didn't say it, you're either a Timberwolves fan or you're fucking lying. We all said they're gonna drop. You can't lose Carl Anthony Towns and like still be okay. You just can't. Well, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Did we all think they were gonna drop to four, motherfucker? They're the one seed right now. They're still there. They're still there. And I said. If they do this, it's going to be on the back of Anthony Edwards going absolutely berserk every single night to a point where we're going to have to start talking about him as MVP. All right, pump the brakes, record scratch, freeze frame. Probably wondering how Nick got here. That did not happen. (laughs) That did not happen. But on the back of dudes like Rudy Gobert, Anthony Edwards, yes, just not on the level that I thought it was going to be, Mike Connolly, Jaden McDaniels, and Nas Reed. Boy, oh boy. Those Timberwolves are fun to watch. We talked about them a little bit on Monday. Still got the Thunder hanging around in the third seed. Only a game back of the one seed. So, so you know, you talk about all these uh, A and B stories. I think the C story here, just because I honestly, for some reason, I'm not as compelled by it as I am by, like, the fourth seed through, like, the ninth seed. I don't know why. In the West, at least. The Thunder, the Nuggets, and the Timberwolves is, like, the really nice C story of who's going to get the one seed. It's separated by one single game between the three of those teams absolutely love it I'm trying to think of like what the maybe do i want to do like an impromptu on the fly best and worst matchups for each team like what the worst case scenario would be here's something that's pissing me off is all these people who are like 
saw this graphic uh, in like a YouTube community post from I think it was NBA on ESPN and they were like the Wizards, the Pistons and the Spurs each have the worst record that they've had in franchise history. Like who has the best chance to turn it around next season? The fuck? What's your problem? Why are we still asking these questions? I say this as a guy who thinks that Detroit, uh, for unbiased, unbiased, but also biased, but just to be clear, unbiased, I think Detroit has some shit to root for. I think we have some nice toys to play with. There are guys on this team who I care about what happens to them in the future. Can't say the same thing about the Wizards. I can say that about the Spurs. You know why? Because they have Victor Wembanyama, who going into next season, we're going to have to be like, is he already a top 10 player? He might be. And if he's not, he's top 15. You're giving that team, presumably, if the if the if the lottery balls fall in their favor, which they fucking shouldn't, because they just got Victor Wembanyama. They do not need another top five pick. Depending on how it shakes out and where they fall, fucking give them seventh, honestly. Disgusting. Even if it's not that great of a draft, you know, you give them a guy like Buzelis or something. It's disgusting. That's disgusting. You know, you think about all the players. We were talking about this very briefly on the shoot-around the other day. And my favorite thing about the NBA is when, you know, it's the beginning of April right now. And you try to think of trades. But that's the thing about the NBA. This is my favorite part is the dudes who we're going to be talking about via the trade market in three months, you'd have had no idea that they were available back in April. It's going to be somebody that we didn't know. But if there's anybody that we could put on that list that we it's we don't technically know, but we're all kind of we're all telegraphing it in real time. We're all thinking the same thing. So the Spurs are going to do the Trey Young thing, right? Right. And if they don't do the Trey Young thing, then they're going to do the Russell Westbrook thing in free agency. Do we like that? How do we feel about that? It's not the same thing, but it's still fun. And I think with how Russ has sort of changed the way that he plays uh, in recent years, I think it could actually be conducive, conductive, synonyms to a successful experience alongside Victor Wembanyama. Not quite on the scale that it would be with Trey Young, but that's the one that I'm going to be rooting for. It'll also be nice to like root for Trey Young because I just don't right now. I'm not like a hater. I'm just kind of like bleh, bleh, mm, boring. Next, although although. After the Texans just traded for Stephon Diggs for essentially a bag of footballs, second round pick my ass. Just kind of goes to show that the Bills just were over it. I'm just saying this is a, does does Texas need more cool shit? Because the roster that they've built in Houston is disgusting. The Texans, I should say. Well, and the Rockets, to, an ex, to some extent, I would say, is disgusting. And that's the other one. Ooh, that's the other one. So Bleach Report, reading this article, that they are interested in trading Shengun and Jalen Green in a package. And then they have like four total picks from Brooklyn. I think two of them are protected and two of them are unprotected. I don't know what the protections are. I believe that's what the whole, the, the, the little cash that they have is, though. Treasure Trove. From the James Harden trade, they want to package that and go do something? What what do you want to do? I'm I'm anti trading Shengun. I think the guy is going to give you twenty ten and five for the next ten years, if not even a little bit, you know, greater. The guy we're talking about is baby. I would I would ship Jabari Smith before I I, I ship Shengun, unless your logic is that you know that Shengun is better. It's just a value thing, and you have to use that to kind of circumvent the wishy washiness of what Jalen has been. Some in some months he's the fucking best player that he's ever been. And in some months you're like, okay, what is this? So you package those two dudes along with X amount of picks. You know, what does that get you? They're not doing the Carl Anthony Towns thing. Like, do they want to do something weird with the Clippers where they're like, what do you think about like a sign and trade for Paul George? What do you think about that? What's going on with his con? That's what he is a free agent this year, right? Whatever he is. Do they do something weird with Paul George? I don't think so. Like, I don't think so. We hypothesized on the shoot around. Does that get you Ja Morant? Yeah, maybe, but fucking no. 
No, it doesn't do that. Do the Rockets. Whoa. Well, why would they? No, no, they wouldn't go after Trey Young because then, like, why do you have Fred Van Vliet? Unless you threw in Fred Van Vliet instead of either Shengun or J- Jalen Green. I feel like I'm talking myself into just an absolute nonsense trade. It's going to be something. He has something on Malachi Flynn. <laughs> also, Flynn Sanity isn't funny. Shut up. No, it's not Flynn Sanity. It's not funny. Don't ever let this happen again. Ever, NBA. Uh, somebody needs to press charges that this even fucking happened in the first... Malachi Flynn, 50 points. Fuck out of here. You ever look up what LaMelo Ball's career high is? It's not 50. It's not even 40. It's 38. Malachi Flynn is a better point guard than LaMelo Ball? Huh. That was not on the Motown Noah 2024 bingo sheet. Malachi Flynn being a better point guard than Lamella Ball. I would like to address very briefly while we're on this. Hey, how about Steve Clifford being like, yeah, I quit. You guys are fucking losers. <laughs> Bunch of bums. <laughs> I can't take it anymore. Being around all these damn kids, all these damn TikTokers who don't care about winning. Steve Clifford's, I'm out of here. Although he's not technically out of there, isn't he? Just assuming a front office role. That's really the path these days, isn't it? Even Dwayne Casey did that. If I really thought about it, put my thinking cap on, I could think of another coach or two that has done something similar. The hell was I going with that? Oh, 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 oh. I wanted to address an allegation that I am secretly a a Miles Bridges fan. No, but (laughs) as a Michigan State fan who I remember him playing at Huntington Prep, I remember him being a recruit for Michigan State and being like, holy shit, it's going to happen for us. He comes to Michigan State, and I believe the first game he played for us was a game inside of an aircraft carrier. or uh, um, Not an aircraft carrier. That was North Carolina. It was in like a, a military base like hangar. It was in a hangar against Arizona, and we wore like digital camo Michigan State uniforms. That was Miles Bridges' first game, and he was yamming on motherfuckers. I remember... Miles Bridges ends his freshman year, and we're all like, he's going to the league. Damn. And he sits up there, and he's like, I got one more in me. And we lost our collective minds. He comes back comes back next year, hits this game winner over Purdue. Like, what he meant to me in my formative, like, high school years, yes, that is always going to be there. And then he goes to the league, and guess what? He's fucking awesome. He's nasty. We love Miles Bridges. And then what else happened? He's the best rapper in the league. And by the way, it's not close. I just popped a bean in the club and I can't move. I loved him. So, yes, it's hard for me as somebody who, again, when I was in high school, like he was he was my life as a Michigan State basketball fan. It sucks that when you're not heroes, I would never wanted to be like Miles Bridges. But when dudes that you fucking loved turn out to be shitheads, yeah, that's tough. (laughs) That's really tough to reconcile. And you trick yourself into doing the whole, oh, I'm just separating the art from the artist. It's like, yeah, yeah. So, no, I'm not a fan anymore. But there is always, I do have a soft spot in my heart for him. And that's not to say, but I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. When that Woj notification comes through that the Pistons signed him to a three-year, you know, $85 million contract, $90 million. Oh, my God. Could you imagine? Could you imagine three years and $90 million for Miles Bridge? Could you fucking imagine? I'll go three for 85. Do they do five for 80? What's the market on him? Do they give him the old Reggie Jackson special and give him five for 80? I don't know. I don't know what he's going to get paid. Because think about how much he was supposed to get paid. Like, like, literally a day after all the shit about him came out was when he was supposed to get paid. I'm saying all this to say I'm not going to be one of those people who are like, who just like switch up and are like, well, Miles Bridges is on my team now. I guess it just kind of is what it. I mean, in some way, you do just kind of have to be like, well, well, fuck. I guess he's here now. Although Browns fans haven't done that with Deshaun. That's true. I don't have to do that at all. I could also easily, easily just not be a fan of him. Because how many Browns fans have emailed into the show? And been like, 
man, it's crazy how much easier it is to root for the Browns when fucking R. Kelly isn't your quarterback. When fucking P. Diddy isn't your quarterback. The fuck? So I guess that's true. Also, because at that point, this is a report out there that from, I think it was from James Edwards III, that the Pistons might hire somebody above Troy Weaver to, like, approve basketball decisions. What the fuck? What? First of all, does Tom not already do that? Does Arn Tellum not already do that? Does Ed Stefanski not already do that? Isn't that why you brought Dwayne Casey in as a as a front office consultant? Is so that you have motherfuckers around who are like, yeah, good idea. Like, no, bad idea. At the end of the day, if Tom and Arn don't want to do something, they won't do it. If they do want to do something and Troy doesn't want to do it, they will do it. Cough, cough. Monty Williams is your fucking coach, by the way. That is the ultimate sign of you're fucked. Fire the guy at that point. I, I, I've been the guy saying I don't even think they, not that I don't think they should, but dog, if they were going to, 27 losses in a row would have been the excuse. If you survive that, you're probably going to survive the season. But if they're going to hire somebody to, like, babysit Troy Weaver, the fuck is going on? Gross. And then that guy's going to be like, this is Miles Bridges. Hmm. Hmm. Now, if we want to do what Houston did uh, this, this previous summer, where it's like, go sign two proven veterans. They got Fred Van Vliet. They got Dylan Brooks. Everybody was like, eh, Maybe. And then the Rockets were like, no, like it works. See, it works. Who would that end up being? Well, Tobias Harris will be a piston if that's what they want to do. Whatever that price tag ends up being. And that's not, you know, that's fine. It's fine. It's not flashy. It's not sexy. It's not cool. I tell you, Pistons fans out there are real juiced over this idea that Carl Anthony Towns is going to come to Detroit. I've been trying to telegraph the Devin Booker thing for how many damn years. And once Matt Ishbia is proven to be Joseph Side 2.0, that will happen and Devin Booker will come home. I stand by that. But the the theory here, if you'll allow me to walk through it uh, for like two seconds very briefly, because I don't really remember what all the theory is with as it relates to Carl Anthony Towns coming to Detroit. It's basically that Minnesota is going to find themselves in cap hell, which is true which is true, and one of these albatross contracts are going to have to get moved, or you're otherwise you're just going to, you're going to be like the Cowboys, and you're just going to be eating a bunch of dead money for X amount of years, right? So what's the easiest thing to do? Well, it's not trading Rudy Gobert for a myriad of reasons. Um, one that's not related to basketball on the court is that you gave up five first-round picks for him, you're not just going to turn around and trade him because you'd be lucky to get half of that. No matter how much on this podcast we've I've turned into a Rudy Gobert defender, you're not getting half of that. And it's not going to be Anthony Edwards because he's fucking Anthony Edwards. It's going to be Carl Anthony Towns, the guy who you've been doing this with for like nine years, eight or nine years at this point. And even if this year has kind of been like a revolution for him in the eyes of the public... It's easiest to do it with him. Also, I think even for his sake, you just wonder, like, what would a change of scenery look like? My question to Pistons fans is this. For what? They don't want Ivy. They don't need him. Do they want a SAR? Mm, I doubt it. I don't want to give him up. Tell you the truth. Oh, Isaiah Stewart. Really? You think? They have Nas Reed. Oh, it's Jalen Duran. Really? You think? They've Rudy Gobert. <laughs> I don't think Minnesota would look at anything that Detroit has and think that the juice is worth the squeeze. In a best case scenario, we draft some fucking idiot in June. Trade him immediately. Go get something. Draft him for somebody else. Take calls. Take calls. Oh, oh, uh, hey. The Knicks? Oh, you want us to get Buzelis? Okay. What are you going to give us? Wow. Josh Hart. Wow. Impressed. Okay. 
I was I had a I had a disgusting intrusive thought when I was watching the Knicks last night. I thought to myself, because I'm I'm just thinking about Bogdanovich and Alec Burks and, and how you know we just did the deal with them, and I was like, who is another player that I think the Knicks would want from Detroit? Thinking to myself, oh my God, it's Isaiah Stewart. <laughs> oh my God. You bring Isaiah Stewart into that second unit in New York, I'm throwing the fuck up. I would I would be I would maybe do the first victory lap I've ever done on this show. In the sense that when I said the worst thing to ever happen to the NBA is the Knicks being run by a genius. Ever since Leon Rose took that job and you couldn't hate the Knicks anymore, because you're like, damn, they're just smart. Like they're just smart. They just have all the right personnel both in the front office and on the court, like they, and on the bench, too, with Tibbs and his staff. Damn it. And that would be the, for me, that would be the tipping point. You get Isaiah Stewart on this, like, three-year, $53 million contract, they'd have, like, two years left of it. But then it's, but what do they, what do they give us? Oh, you want Miles McBride? Troy would probably fucking take that. I'd throw up. Miles McBride is fine. He's fine. He's like, well, well, hold on. Hold on. I would do it. Ooh, ooh, raising the roof. Dante DiVincenzo. Boom, boom. I would do it. I would do it. And then they can supplement him with Miles McBride. This isn't even that diluted is the thing. Because, well, it is and it isn't. The Knicks, I, I, I spent 10 minutes talking about, yeah, the Knicks will be survivable in the playoffs as long as they can get it from a guy like Dante DiVincenzo while in the same breath being like, they're going to trade him. They're going to trade him for Isaiah Stewart. It's going to happen, folks. It's not. It's not. But but something will. And the early reports have been that Detroit will be active in free agency with their 60 million, 61 million, I believe, most open cap in the league this summer. Ooh. Oh, can't wait to fucking see what happens. Oh, my God. I need desperately a big swing in my life. Can you fucking imagine if... They're just waiting for Zach Levine to get healthy. <laughs> just to make sure that he can physically walk around and that he like can play basketball. And they're like, okay, all right, cool. We'll do the deal. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hey, we are 52 minutes into this episode. Holy shit, am I about to do the full episode basically in one breath? I didn't even realize we had been going this long. I wanted to do a quick um, – fuck – Fuck, I was supposed to cut this like 20 minutes ago. We're just going to do this on the fly and we're not going to cut. Really quick, uh, while I'm pulling up this email, I wake up this morning and J. Cole responded to Drake. Or, I'm sorry, to Kendrick. Oh. Oh. Okay. So I'm, I'm literally just laying in bed. I'm holding it up to my ear. Like trying to dissect on the fly. Here was my takeaway. Big time hold me back energy from J. Cole. Didn't say anything too crazy the same way that Kendrick didn't say anything too crazy because this felt very much like it was round one. And so you just hope the same way that it only took Jermaine like a week to get into the studio and get some shit penned and get it recorded and get it all this shit. Took about a week. You hope that it's the same for Kendrick. I mean, the rumor is that he has one for Drake in the chain. Because I just think it's it's corny as fuck for J. Cole to be like, ooh, I got, I could drop two classics right now. Do it. Do it. Honestly, just do it. What are we waiting for? Because the rumor is that Kendrick could do it too. But that was that one was just specifically about Drake. And I, don't, I would just be surprised if Drake says anything. Because what we're going to get from Drake is he's going to come out with an album. I know he's he said he's on a bit of a hiatus for a little bit, so we might not even get an album this year, but he's fucking Drake. So let's just assume we will. Drake is going to wait like eight months when everybody's forgotten about this and nobody cares, and he's going to drop like a bar and a half about it in one song where it's like very clearly about Kendrick, and we're all like, whoa. And then he's going to drop like two more that are like subliminally about him that you could interpret to be about some other people. And it's just going to be annoying. It's like, oh, bitch made. Like, you couldn't have just done this before. Maybe I'll be wrong, and he'll just, maybe he'll just record something. Record something, Aubrey. To end today's show, I wanted to put a pin in what ended up being 
you know, we talk about a three round fight. This gorilla versus grizzly bear thing. Let's put a close to this chapter. Okay. And I can't remember now that I'm trying to do this on the fly. I can't seem to find the email. I'm going to cut to when I can find the email. All right. This email comes to us from Max. The only reason I want to read this, we are, we are, this is the final chapter tentatively for grizzly bear versus gorilla because we just haven't heard that many honest perspectives from the grizzly bear team. If you're new to the show, you've missed a few episodes. You don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, in Monday's episode, so the previous episode, and then I think one or two before that, we did a discussion about grizzly bear versus a gorilla who would win. I am very strongly team gorilla and the consensus is overwhelmingly the opposite and that you guys are and I said in the last episode I said either I'm dumb as fuck or you guys are dumb as fuck but I'm inclined to believe that it cannot possibly be me. So, as fun as this has been to um engage in with you guys, it generated way more engagement than I fucking we've gotten more emails about this in the last 3 days than we've gotten emails period in the last 4 weeks. So, I want to read one final email as it pertains to the grizzly bear's perspective, just so I'm being fair, and then we'll we'll put a pin in this for a while, <laughs> okay? This email comes to us from Max. Max, welcome to the show. Hello, Nick. I've held back from emailing in for quite a while, as I am a delusional Warriors fan whose favorite player is Draymond Green. I have, to put it lightly, controversial opinions about recent NBA history, and nobody needs to hear that. However, Recent comments on your show revealed to me that you are clearly a component of the guerrilla propaganda machine and an unaware and are unaware of the terrifying nature of most bears, let alone a fucking grizzly. Some bullets don't stop them. A gorilla would be a sack of meat and broken bones before it had the chance to game plan. Grizzlies have razors attached to their fist. They are bigger. They are better protected. They aren't dumb either, which is to break the email, a point that I was making. They aren't dumb, either. In fact, their intelligence is up there with apes. This conversation shouldn't even exist. This is ridiculously clear-cut. By making this a one-on-one, -on -one, you take away one of the biggest evolutionary advantages a gorilla has, that being, that being their complex social life and ability to work in a group. Side note, th okay, thank you for all this. That's the email from Max. And I think I liked it because it was rooted in shit that was actually real, okay? Now, just very, I said we were only going to read one, but I just want to throw this out there, too. Although, here we go again, and I'm not going to be able to find it. Hold on. Nope, I'm not going to cut this. This has got to stay right here. This is going to stay right here. Motherfucker's sending in, like, TikTok. Guys, I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to watch a TikTok. And be, oh, this is very compelling. I thank you for trying. I'm not going to fucking put a TikTok on the show out of your mind. This one comes to us from Wiley. Wiley, welcome to the show. Hi, Mr. Town. Just wanted to weigh in on my perspective. As a people, we go camping in grizzly-infested woods all the time. But could you imagine if we had gorillas out there? Never in a million years would I go camping in the woods if I knew that gorillas were just chilling out there. That is all. Team Gorilla. Wiley, I could not agree with you more. <laughs> a point that I somehow did not make, but I only and explicitly agree with. So thank you for that. Folks, I think that's going to do it for today's show. And I think that's going to do it for the gorilla versus grizzly bear conversation. At this point, we've all made up our minds, okay? At this point, I don't think anybody's mind is going to be changed. Keep it civil. <laughs> Please. <laughs> but a gorilla would kick the shit out of a grizzly bear. He just would. He just would. He just would. Okay? He just would. That's my closing thought. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are listening to this on Spotify, be sure to rate five stars. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave a little like, nice little, nice little comment for the algorithm. Did I say subscribe? Do that and then make a second account and then resubscribe. Don't actually, you don't have to do that. How many, I got so many burner emails. Why don't I just subscribe? I have like seven emails. Why don't I just subscribe on all of those? Really juice my numbers up and then play the coping hour on in like seven different tabs at the same time and really juice those numbers. Place a bunch of mid rolls and then is that that has to be it's not illegal it's not illegal but that feels like in, not embezzlement fraud i don't know why i'm like i'm doing this like i'm a crab i will catch you guys a whole hour by the way a whole hour i just want to throw that out the whole hour on accident that i didn't cut 
I'm just throwing that out. Although, I guess technically there was the part where I had to cut out because I just couldn't find the email. That does not fucking count. That does not count. The raw file is at 59, 60 minutes. That is an hour long. That is what the raw file is at right now. Okay, fuckers? Hold out. Nick, good job. I will catch you guys. Computers now have In the next control. Beautiful, beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful. Primary control. Beautiful.